Hey, have you ever wanted to expose a secondary external facing API to your regular web app and maybe consume it and do code generation to build out how clients are going to access that external API? If so, this is the episode for you. Hey, welcome. This is episode 27 of Code Hour, and in this one, I'm going to go over how to create external APIs and how to consume them in websites, ASP.NET Core websites that are exposing their APIs with Swagger, and uh, that that is being generated by Swashbuckle, and that then I'm going to show how to consume that with NSwag into like a console app, and. I'm going to do this for an ASP.NET boilerplate site, but it doesn't have to necessarily be specific to ASP.NET boilerplate. Um, if you're not familiar with ASP.NET boilerplate, by the way, do check out my YouTube channel. I've got a whole section on ASP.NET boilerplate content, and there's a whole channel there for it. So, okay, let's get right into it. So, assuming that I've got a site here, which happens again to be built on ASP.NET a boilerplate. Uh, I'm going to run the host here and when I do that you'll see there it is that there is a swagger file and this swagger file is if you're not familiar with it it is a JSON file and that JSON file describes all of the API endpoints that are available and then the product that's automatically generating that from the site is called Swashbuckle, and Swashbuckle is a wonderful tool. They, uh, they have it here on their GitHub site, seamlessly adds a swagger to a web API projects, but it does a lot more than that. It also makes this really pretty UI here that you can dig into if you want to. You can try it out, and you can post sample things. It even has authentication. So what I want to do is make one of these but make another one of them for an external API, a second API. And the idea for this post was actually, I came about it from, I had to do it for my own project work, but then also somebody asked me about it on uh, YouTube. So uh, thank you for Alejandro Sousa, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, for that question. And I've got a blog post that goes along with this, and so I might occasionally pull things up from my blog post. So let's do this. Let's let's make a second Swagger file. But I guess before we even do that, we want to create a second API endpoint. So I'm going to put it here. Now you know there's a there's a host project and a core project, and generally we want to be using the core whenever possible. And so I'm going to add a new controller. And in previous episodes, I've shown how to use the app services, ASP.NET Boilerplate's app services, and those are great when you want to expose an application, an API to your SPA endpoint, but they're not as great when you want to control exactly the way that it looks and it feels, and so that's what we're going to be doing here. So I'm going to create a, actually create a new folder. I'm going to put all of the, call it client, I'm going to put all of the these APIs and client, and maybe eventually we're going to have a V2, so let's add a V1. And it's always a good idea to start thinking about versioning. And I'll call this product, product controller. There we go. ASP.NET Boilerplate Lace, if we inherit from this one that it generates for us. And then we need an API. We're going to call this public get product with an int product ID. And because this is ASP.NET Boilerplate, I can still use constructor injection. So I can ask for an I repository. There we go. And lastly, product repository dot get.
Okay, so we've got a single method which does HTTP GET. Here's what our where the endpoint that we want it to look like, and we're taking a product ID. And let's see if this works. So if I go back over to my Swagger file and I refresh, hopefully, I see a new API slash client. Oh, we need uh, that was fine. We need these to be squiggles, I think, like that. There we go. That's looking good. Products, and it's not here. Yeah, it is. It's here. It just put it under products, which is fine. API client products. Okay, and we could try executing it. Try it out. Product two. Four of four. Oh, there we go. I didn't have a product uh, two, but I do have a product one, and here it is. It's the cyber shader. Okay, awesome. So now we need to take this API here, but we really want to expose it in a completely separate Swagger file. Well, that turns out to be a little bit easier to do than you'd think it might be. We can go over to, and actually, if there's a there's a section on um, the Swashbuckle website here on how to do this, and you can go down to okay well never mind it's it's somewhere in there they've got some documentation on that to do but I've got a much easier version of the documentation which is available for this and that is going to be oh by the way here's a, a UI a visualization of what it is I'm trying to do all right so we're gonna call a add swagger and we do that a second time so okay here we are so this is where we're adding support for Swagger automatic generation with Swashbuckle. And we just need a second one of these where we're adding a second Swagger doc and we'll call it v1-client. And let's see, least store client API version v1, I don't know, dash client. The important thing here is this first parameter. And when we recompile this, it ought to give us a second Swagger file, which I can get to by going to, well, here's the first one, first of all. Okay, and I should ha now have a v1-client. Okay, that's good, it's good. It's Now those two things are identical, so that's less than good, but uh, it's a good start. And um, but we, can do, we can do better, a little bit better than that. Right now, this is the Swagger UI, and we can also add our new Swagger file into this dropdown, and that turns out to be also pretty easy and that happens down here where you say I'm going to add a swagger endpoint so I'm adding up adding my there's a middleware component which adds the swagger UI and then I just want to add a second swagger endpoint which will look very similar to this and so this is going to be a dash client please store client API v1 if I recompile that, hey, look at that. There's two drop downs. Okay, that's great. And they're showing the two Swagger files. You can see that which ones they're using as their source over here. But we still have this problem of the two Swagger files contain the exact same code. And so to fix that, we have to understand a little bit about how Swagger works. And to understand that, we have to a little bit understand a little bit more about how ASP.NET Core works. So and when I was building this out, I was actually learning that ASP.NET Core has a component to it, which is called, uh, has a component to it, which is called the API Explorer. And the API Explorer is like a metadata layer that exposes all of the information that's available in ASP.NET Core to some third party, or you can use it internally. There's various different ways you can use it. And Swagger uses that to generate the APIs. So that's cool and there in particular is a property here and in my blog post uh, lee richardson.com by the way api description group name so it's it's the api description group name that we need to set and swashbuckle determines whether to include a particular method in a particular swagger document based on the group name if the group name is null then it always includes it and if the group name is the name of the endpoint, which is either in this case v1 or v1-client, 
then it'll include it. The default value for that group name is null, and so that's why all API endpoints are always included in both of the Swagger files. So what we need is a way to, to set that. There are two ways. There is actually, we could go over to the controller and say API Explorer settings, and then in here you can set the group name. And that would be good, but the problem is I'd have to set that on every single method because otherwise the null value means that things are going to be in all of there's anything with a null value is it's going to be hard to maintain it's going to um, be a, a pain to do so what we want is the more magical solution all right and the magical solution is we can go over into startup and register a new uh, filter for the api explorer uh, i got this wrong it's i'm not adding a new filter i'm adding a new convention Convention Swagger File Picker Convention. There we go. That's that's what I'm looking to do. That's controller model convention. Okay, there's a bunch of different conventions we could add, and so this one gives us this one gives us the controller model, and then that get, we, from there we can get the namespace. Okay, there we go. So when we apply this Swagger file picker convention, it's going to pull down the namespace, uh, and then it's going to, I pulled up the second to last element. So it's it's taking this, right? So it's reversing it. So that's the first one, that's the second one. So I skip this one and I go to that one. So that's the split reverse first or default. And then it, it's external if that is happens to be the word client. And so if it is external, then we want it to go to client v1, else we want it to go to, oops, that was we want it to go v1, right? Okay, this might work. And in fact, I think it's actually not going to because there's still one more thing to do besides the syntax error. Yeah, there it is, it's still there. API client v1, and I'm, I'm gonna, bet that's still going to be in here client API yep that's still in there hang hang on we're almost there there's one more piece of the puzzle here and that is this when we add the swagger file we said the doc inclusion predicate that says this and this overrides everything else this says should this endpoint be included in the swagger file and right now this is just saying always include everything and so that's overriding everything I think if we get rid of that that's an improvement okay okay we got get get all yeah the client is missing that's that's fantastic this is this is going in the right direction uh, the client API that was empty so it didn't go into it. I probably called it the wrong thing this should be called the v1 dash client v1 dash client that's going to work now this by the way is why you should not use magic strings um, I'm, I'm just kind of going quick quick and loose here but in a production app for goodness sakes always use constants um, and, and you know put these things in separate files and all that um, I, could, I could do that but let's just try it let's see, I'm gonna recompile hey look at that all right like to see that that is that is uh, two separate swagger files we got there it's looking good and if we zip on into this one we'll see that's really nice and short it's just saying hey, we've got a products and you know I probably should have returned a product DTO now that I'm looking at that 
I should have said product DTO and I should have mapped it back and all that. Well, you know the best practices. Do, do the best practices, don't do what I do. That's what I always tell my daughter. Do as, do as I say, not as I do. Okay, so now I'm going to want to consume that. So we've got, we've got everything set up right. And you, you know, it'd be really nice if we could just do code generation the same way NSWAG and ASP.NET Boilerplate generates all that giant TypeScript client, which makes calling into the backend super easy in TypeScript. Well, we can do the same thing for a desktop app. So that would be uh, that would be a really nice thing to do. I'm going to first add a command line app, and that command line app is going to be the thing that's going to consume it. So. Fantastic. You need to get that, that proxy generated. And uh, I, you know, I love cake. I probably um, include it in a lot of my videos a lot more than some people would like, but that's just the nature of the beast. So I'm going to create a cake. I'm going to include cake. And if you're not familiar with it, by the way, I've got a whole presentation on why it's wonderful and why you should use it. Oh, intro to cake, episode 16. So yeah, check out episode 16 if you are wondering why I'm using cake. And I've got the cake plugin, so uh, that means I can control shift P and say cake install to workspace. What's the file name? Build.cake. Yes, I want bootstrappers. Yes, I want a config file. Sure, install the dependencies, blah, blah, blah. We don't need this setup and teardown stuff. Um, and so just to run this, make sure it actually works. Oh, that took a long time. It, it did work though. Yes, hello cake, fantastic. We're gonna create a new one that's, um, and there's a plugin for this NSWAG uh, tool. And I'm gonna just plunk that right out of my blog post. It'll be easier. Okay, I've got the plugin. This is the cake code gen NSWAG plugin. And then I'm going to Create a new task. Oh, IntelliSense isn't turned on. Ah, sometimes when the IntelliSense doesn't work, it's because it's trying to use the solution. We just tell it to use the cake file by clicking on the thing down there. There we go. Okay, I had to, uh, if you missed all that, I had to reload the window, I had to set cake as the default, and then I had to install the dependencies, and then eventually it worked. So we want to do it from a JSON spec, right? And we're gonna to need to download that JSON spec. I showed in the blog post that uh, I was going to download it, but it looks like it actually will support a URI. So how about we specify the URI here? Let's give this a shot. Thanks for hang, uh, hanging out with me there while I typed a bunch of stuff. Let's see if this works. I'll run it, and hopefully it downloads this and generates a proxy from that Swagger file. Ooh, it said it succeeded, and it ran quickly. What do you think? What are the odds? Oh, that should have updated. I would have expected it to. Oh, that, 
wasn't a very good error message. Okay, the problem was I forgot the ASP.NET Core folder. Ah, software development. Never goes easy. It says it succeeded. Hey, there we go. Client proxy, client API proxy. There we go. This was auto-generated, generated by the NSWAG toolchain, blah, 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 blah. This all looks good. It's complaining now because it's got a Newton soft error. We can fix that. That'll be easy to fix. Let's add a NuGet package to this. I bet you that just compiles now. Oh, it does. It does. It compiles. And so now I ought to be able to create a new one of those inside of my program where I had just been doing a write line. I'm going to do a new client API proxy. Ugh, I probably called it something wrong. I just called it a client. My namespace? Ugh, the namespace is wrong. Everything's wrong about this. There we go. That's better. Oh my gosh. Uh, that last error, I'll tell you, just uh, takes so much patience being a software developer sometimes. Okay, I had to get the C-sharp uh, generator settings. This, oh, this had to not be a lambda. It looked like it was a lambda at first, but I was wrong. So, okay, so now I ought to be able to generate one of these client API proxies. Bingo. And it wants a... Uh, base URL, which for me, this is the kind of thing you'd want to configure in production if this were real, but I'm just going to say I want it to be that, and okay, client API proxy dot product async. Okay, this is looking good. And we send in a product ID. We know one should come back with something good. So we want the product ID. Control F5 on the host. And that'll make sure it's running without debugging. And it'll just keep running in the background just like we like. And then I'll set this as my startup project. Quick little tip there, if you right click and just hit the A button on your keyboard, it sets the startup project. I do that a lot. Now I'm gonna hit F5. And hopefully, it'll say your product is. Oh, yeah. So this is another problem. It took me a while to figure this one out. If you were to open Fiddler right now, and run this again, There it is. Okay, I made a request over to localhost 21021 client v1 product one. Okay, looks good. Let's take a look inside of here. You're gonna see this JSON. Let's just see the raw view. We're gonna see this has a squiggle and a result and a name and a target URL and a success true. There's like all this extra stuff in there. Really, all we want is this part name quantity ID. Right, and so this is an ASP.NET boilerplate trickery. Actually, it's a nice feature of ASP.NET boilerplate because it's what enables when you say throw new friendly user friendly exception, and it pops up that nice little dialogue that's like, hey, you know, whatever you type in that string, it pops it up in a, a pretty modal dialogue to the user. It's using this facility. In fact, all exception handling is uh, because of this wrapping, but we don't want wrapping for our external API. And so we can turn it off. And to turn that off, we have to go over to the products controller. And we can do it at the method level or the class level. I'm going to do it at the controller level here. ABP. Oh, it's, it's just don't wrap result. There we go. And so we want to say for wrap on success. That's the important one, false wrap on error, false, um, and then we can say log error, which is saying, do we want to, the log errors? Yeah, sure, we want the log errors, that's a nice feature. So now if I recompile this, I think that should be all I need. Now I just hit F5, debug.
Hey, look at that. We got it. We got it. I love that. Uh, your product is so <laughs> shame. And you can see the reason that this actually worked is because over here in Fiddler, the raw, res raw result down here is just this nice clean name quantity ID. So that's great. The one last thing we might want to tidy this up a little bit with is this is called product repository get async. Um, and I don't like that method name. And the problem is that the API Explorer is not exposing the names by default. And so when it doesn't have the, when Swashbuckle doesn't have the names, then it doesn't provide out an operation ID. An operation ID is one of those values that consumers like NSWAG can use to get a, a method name. And so what we need to do is we need to include that as a parameter to the API Explorer. And we can do that in the HTTP, HTTP GET method. So if we go to the products controller, then here where we're doing HTTP GET, we can specify the name here. So we can put whatever we want here, and um, it's just because of the nice C-sharp, uh, I don't know, five feature, we, instead of putting in a hard code thing which could get out of sync, we can just say name of get product, which is really nice because anytime we rename this, it automatically goes in there. So if I, if I first of all, I guess, I can just prove to you that there's an operation ID behind the scenes here, or that there isn't. And if I recompile this, and I rerun this, oh, there you go. That was subtle, but here it is. There's an operation ID parameter. And now if I regenerate my client, there it is. Product ID is no longer accurate. It's called get product async. And now we have full control over what those names are going to be. And so that's really all there is to it. So that is how to create an external API and consume it using NSWAG, Swashbuckle, and Swagger files. And the only thing that I haven't shown, and it's a lot more work, and I'm going to do it in a, a subsequent episode, is how to secure it. Because right now, this is all completely without any authentication or authorization. And we love the authorization. I love the authorization anyway that's in ASP. Dot net uh, boilerplate, but I really would want something like API keys. I would want an API key and a secret. Not I wouldn't want people authenticating using their their usernames and passwords. So I'm going to show that in a subsequent episode. So I hope you have enjoyed. If this was useful to you, please like, uh, subscribe, and otherwise I will see you next time.